for the day is from Chief Segwalis of the Iroquois Confederacy. He said, ours was a wealthy society. No one suffered from want. All had the right to food, clothing, and shelter. All shared in the bounty of the spiritual ceremonies in the natural world. No one stood in any material relationship of power over anyone else. No one could deny anyone access to the things they needed. All in all, before the colonists came, ours was a beautiful and rewarding way of life. And, uh, you know, this is something that if you take, like, Thomas Jefferson's diaries and juxtapose them with Jared Bernstein's Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, you know, the, 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 ancient, the old, the, the early European look at Native Americans, and I mean, it wasn't the super early, but it was one of the early ones. And, uh, and then check out Peter Farb's book, uh, Man's Rise to Civilization, which is, I think, the best ethnography, the best, you know, uh, social look at, at how the Native Americans uh, in North America lived at point of first contact, at the time that they were first encountered by Europeans. What you, what you get, and then you look at the history of the, of the North American continent and what happened to the sloth, the three-toed sloth, and what happened to the, to the, uh, uh, the North American version of the woolly mammoths, and you know, what happened to the saber-toothed tigers, and what ha- you know, where'd, where'd they all go? And it sure looks like, if you look at the historical record and you look at the, at the geologic record, that human beings came to North America 20 to 30,000 years ago, and I think that you know, there's a consensus forming that there was um, you know, possibly one wave that came into South America from uh, actually by sea, and another wave that came over the Bering Strait from the north. And, but in any case, Asians came to North America between 20 and 30,000 years ago and proceeded to basically wipe out much of the ecosystem of at least the North American continent, at least our part, you know, the United States part, the, the really temperate, comfortable part of the North American continent. And the result of that was environmental collapse in a, in a lot of places. I mean, there were, there were major, like, mound building. There, down in uh, what is now New Orleans, they, they, they were building pyramids that, that in some cases were almost as big as the pyramids in Egypt. They were just made out of brick so that they, you know, they, they weathered away, although some of them still exist. I mean, they're all over North America, actually. And so, you know, you had these elaborate societies, and, and they died at their own hand by, by destroying their, their ecosystem and by killing off the large animals that could be prey. And what came out of that was a forehead slap and a, holy cow, how did we do this to ourselves? And what came out of that was, let's figure out a way to, to live that makes sense. And in the case of the Iroquois, for example, there was, there was this, uh, this fellow, the stutterer was his name in English. I, I'm sorry, I do not, I don't, I'm doing this from memory, not from notes. I, I don't have uh, his, I can't remember his name. It's a long, difficult to pronounce name in the original Iroquois. His assistant, the fellow who spoke on his behalf, was named Hiawatha, not the one of Longfellow's poem. And he came to the Iroquois people and, ba- you know, as kind of a Jesus-like figure, basically, or at least in legend, said, here's how to live. You know, here's how to make things happen. Here's, here's, aha, uh-huh, okay. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to call in or if you tried to call in, by the way, just, you know, we're, our phone system just crashed and we're rebooting it, so give us a shout back. Um, in any case, he, he, he basically came and he said, okay, here's the system. You know, here's, here, much like law, you know, much like Moses, and, you know, here are the laws. And, the, and one of the laws is anything you do, you have to do thinking of what its consequence will be. Any decision you make, you must make in the context of the seventh generation from now. In other words, we don't, we don't leave this earth to our children. We are borrowing it from them. And not just our children, but our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren, and, and so forth. Seven generations down. And that was the, the, you know, that was the core of most of the law of the Iroquois Confederacy. And so they ended up with a three-branch governmental system. 
basically a legislature, a judiciary, and an executive, as it were, branch. The executive was the most obligated to everybody person. It's really interesting. When you, when you look at the power relationships in the Iroquois Confederacy, and this is like really, really well documented. Peter Farb did a brilliant job of documenting it, but there's, I, I, I wrote about it at some length in my book, The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, and I went back and I, you know, Jefferson wrote about this in his diaries. I mean, it's just fascinating stuff. If you were the chief, that meant that you had the greatest obligation to everybody. You were the poorest. Anything you owned belonged to everybody. You were the person, and because nobody was wealthy. I mean, every, everybody shared everything. There was this genuine sense of community and a genuine sense of obligation. And when people started trying to lock up the food, when people started hoarding things, when people, you know, the, the, the Iroquois identified that as a mental illness. They did away with, and, and those people ultimately, if they couldn't be cured, they were banished. They also, they also did away with war. They still had to have ways of, of solving tribal conflicts, intertribal conflicts, and, and interclan conflicts, and they did it with a game that they invented that we still play in North America. It's called lacrosse. And in fact, hanging in the National Gallery here in Washington, D.C., is this giant painting that was painted like in the 1830s or 1850s of this giant Iroquois Confederacy battle. 10,000, you know, uh, young warriors playing lacrosse. It was a four-day lacrosse game. I mean, it's really, so it's like they, they had this, they created this eco-side, this, they destroyed their environment, they learned from it, and came up with a sustainable way of living. That's what gives me hope for us. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Because just personally, I think we're kind of reliving the whole thing, and we're on the edge of ecological, economic, and, and human disasters that we will wake up from.